Welcome to the Nebraska Soybean Board Weekly Market Roundup being brought to you by Nebraska Soybean Farmers and their checkoff. I'm Susan Littlefield. Happy end of a week that was kind of a crazy roller coaster type of one. We're really going to dive into what's been going on in this market. Maybe for some, as it was put by both gentlemen joining me today, kind of a wake up call in the trade. We'll also take a look at some pricings that maybe we're going to see or maybe not see both May, May corn and beans move to. We'll take a look at uh, weather happenings, not only abroad, but here in the States, what that might mean for planting time. And what about come harvest? We've got a lot to dive into on this end of week. We'll have more coming up after this. Imagine a future fueled by soy-based possibilities. A future where creativity and productivity live together under one roof. A future that takes you from point A to point B to point Z, all while ensuring brighter tomorrows for our next generation. A soy-based future? It's already here. Well, welcome back. As you can see, joining me is Darren Fessler. Darren, of course, with Lakefront Futures and Jeff Peterson with Heartland Farm Partners. And and gentlemen, to say a wake up call, I think when Darren, you said that both heads agreed immediately, you both were talking about it. Let's talk about this wake up call that our grain farmers are having to deal with. Yeah, you look, you come into this week, um, the, the, the March board coming off the first notice day on Monday, and then you then you always have you move a lot of the open interest to the May contract. And we kept just floating around these resistance levels that we had been for the last month. And, you know, it, it, it's something that when you look at it from a technical pattern and you just can't break it, and then all of a sudden the funds give way and, hey, we're, we're running out. And, and it just gave way through more to more selling. And, and you, you start getting calls from producers like, maybe where is the bottom? Is this enough? I, I, I look back at it, boy, I should have done more. I, I should have listened to this wreck or that wreck or whatever it may have been. And, and, and I think that you look at this whole week and going into, you know, planting season and even coming off of last year, things have been very good, especially in parts of Nebraska that had hail, had wind. You got huge insurance checks. You were able to replant it in a timely manner, and you were able to recapture some really good profits at those levels. So I don't want to say complacency may have, may have set in, but this market and, and this week alone, I think, was a wake-up call. Hey, the market gives it the market market take it the way type of thing. And, and I think that's what really uh, the thought of the calls were this week. Jeff, what about for you when it comes to this wake up call in these grains? Well, I think for me, if you go back and look at what the human nature is uh, as it deals with the markets, when, when the markets start taking off and they start going higher, generally what we end up seeing is we see a, a lot of times people will make sales and they'll sell too soon. And, and ultimately, then all of a sudden the market peaks. And then this particular market's a dangerous one because we've been hanging up in some levels for quite a while. And it's not that people haven't made sales, they have. But what we run into is it seems like you get comfortable and all of a sudden you feel like, well, it won't go back down. And if it does, it'll go down rather slowly. And and actually the rollover that we had, you know, it was a very abrupt. In a matter of, you know, five, six days, we're dropping corn you know, over 50 cents, actually over the course of about seven days. And, you know, that's a big move. And normally you'd only see those type of moves happen during weather markets. And and Darren's exactly right. All of a sudden you get this feeling of, wait a minute, have we found a bottom and, and what's going to happen here? And boy, I wish I had to take action. And those are all kind of normal responses that we have when you've got a market and a move kind of like what we've had, Susan. So I'm curious, and I'll ask both of you guys this. Uh, Darren, do you think at this point, Guys are getting ready for spring planting. The, we know that in the south and southern Texas, they're already wrapping up some of this corn planting. But do we get to a point where we start maybe questioning our marketing plans that we used in the previous year and what maybe we should or shouldn't be doing in this coming growing season? That That's an excellent question. I, I, you look at the last couple of years, it didn't really pay for a lot of producers to sell early. I mean, they you know, you held bushels, uh, you, you held off making new crop sales, you were rewarded to, for doing so for whatever reason it may have been and, and and like i always tell clients it's the two out of ten years that may have worked it's the eight out of the ten years that really may bite you and so if we just have a holistic approach and take each mark near a little bit you know differently um you know i think that we can maybe take out a little bit of the emotion in in, in the markets and i think that's 
probably the biggest thing and a lot of producers struggle with is just the emotional, you know, ups and downs of the environment that we're in and that we trade every day. So. Well, having said that then Jeff is, as you look at the, the last year's marketing plans or looking at what this year's harvest might be like, they've got a lot of concerns like they did last year about weather and other factors working in. Is this going to be another roller coaster type of marketing year? Well, I think it's going to be a marketing year that's, that's going to surprise us because I think the general feeling and, and a little bit of that becomes because we are so par- so dry in parts of Nebraska is that, boy, the general feeling is if, if you talk about wanting to make sales, it's like, well, we don't dare sell because we're so dry. You know, if we don't get some moisture, it'll be a really bad crop. But the other side of that gets to be, I, I think we can actually have a really good crop. And I know you and I, Susan, were even talking earlier, you know, about yields. And I came out with the 181.5. I said that, you know, I think it could even be a little higher than that at the 183 if we get some normal type weather because these hybrids are really good. And and I think of this year as kind of a transition year. And we're transitioning off of where we've been really tight. Could prices go really high later on? Well, sure, they could, but it's not probably the normal probability that that's going to physically happen. You'd have to have some surprise items that would come in. And I guess I'd rather be one who's going to make some sales, get get a good book of sales on, and then if we have to down the road, defend it if we need to, rather than hold off and and hope for what's going to come down the road, Susan. So is there a bottom in this market as we move forward? First with corn. Well, I think we have found a temporary bottom. I don't think we found a long-term bottom. I think we found a temporary bottom in here. Um, if you If you go back and look at kind of just the May contract and look at kind of where the low would have been back, you go back and in July and you look at kind of where the high had been going back in, you know, uh, for the move back into, you know, latter part of October. And we, we really kind of retraced about you know, a little over 61.8% of that move, kind of found some support in here and, and we can bounce it up higher, which is not unheard of based on having that big a pullback. But to think that we're going to go just continue to bounce back up to the levels we were at without having some additional bullish information, I mean, we can bounce up into this area and maybe a little bit higher, but we're going to have to have more bullish news in order to keep it going, Susan. Darren, what about the soybeans? As we continue with the soybean report, is a bottom in place or like what Jeff was just saying, it's not yet there? I, I think Jeff nailed it on the head with corn absolutely perfectly. Uh, on the bean side of things, I, we still don't know about Argentina. I think a lot of Argentina is priced in. I think I think the argument comes, oh, we're arguing over one or two, three million metric tons at this point when we should be looking at the overall, uh, what is South America production versus last year? There's still going to be that 12 to 15 million metric tons higher. Right. And Brazil, even though we've seen some downgrades with their estimates and maybe some wet wet feet when it comes to the bean harvest, it, it, Brazil is probably still going to do that 150 plus. And whether it whether uh, Argentina is at 31 or 33 million, it's not going to really matter all that much. I think you've seen some option activity this week that suggests that China is back in the market. The spread action has been really friendly over the last few days. So yes, I, I think maybe a near term bottom is in uh, on old crop and even a new, but longer term. Uh, I, again, Jeff is spot on. We've had dryness. Weather does change. Patterns do change change. And it, it comes back to an issue where near term bottom, yes, longer term, you know, if, if we have decent acres, we have decent weather, it's not it's not out of question that we can't be printing under or testing under sub 13 new crop beans here later on in the year. So when we get these rallies, they, they probably should be rewarded or at least have a plan in place when they do so. So realistically, could we see a more intense corn versus bean acreage fight? I think that's what you're seeing right now. If you look at the bean corn ratio, we're at the highest levels we've been since the late or the fall of 2021. So I, I, I am a little bit concerned about acres. I more so concerned about cotton and how it impacts corn. But yeah, I, I'm at right now I'm at 92 million on corn, 87 on beans. I don't think they're going much more than that on corn. Uh, beans, I think, is the big question. I think that's why you've seen that ratio start to uptick here in the you know, last few weeks here. So, Jeff, if we don't get the wheat emergence like we had hoped for in this winter wheat crop, they've got to plant something else. Is that going to put any pressure on this trade? Well, that's that's a very good point because we did see a lot of you know acres out there that did go into wheat and a, a larger increase than maybe even what some of the trade were thinking. And at some point, you know, could those end up getting tore up and going back to something else? It depends on where you're at. You know, could some of that work its way back into grain sorghum? 
know, that would be something, especially if you're down into Kansas. So that's that's possible. If the rains did come in, could some of that work its way over to corn and beans? That's possible, but but honestly, for the amount of acres I think we'll see happen on that, I, I don't think that'll be a, a big item. But one thing I do think we'll have to look at down the road, if we would have some really good conditions, and let's say this wheat crop in some areas does get off that decent start, there, there is a chance that if bean prices hold in there, we could see higher amounts of the double crop soybeans happen, and then that would get factored in and be one way to bring up basically the amount of bean acres without necessarily adjusting, you know, and taking away from the corn side. Well, we can't finish up this conversation today without asking about this cattle market and if they have maybe taken advantage of what we see in the corn trade. I, I certainly think they have. I mean, if you look at even the cash prices so far this week, the, they have been on fire. Uh, and I think the cattle fundamentals remain strong. I mean, we've settled near the highest day on feeders and, you know, fat market remains strong. I mean, there was a little bit of weakness here this week, but they, they've turned around here. And so I do look, uh, if we can continue to build on, you know, maybe knock on wood, some better economic data. Now, granted, we have a big, big week next week with Fed speak and interest rate decisions. But again, if the economy can be stronger than what it is currently, I think that I think cattle can uh, really start to participate even more on the upside. So again, I, I continue to be friendly cattle in general. Well, it was really nice, gentlemen, to really see some green on the screen in all aspects, except unfortunately the wheat complex. So hopefully we can continue that trend and have a good week next week when so many folks are at Commodity Classic. That's exactly right, Susan. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining Jaron Feschler and Jeff Peterson joining us this week. And we always want to remind folks, commodity futures and options do involve a substantial risk of loss, not suitable to all investors. As we wrap up this first trading week in March, that has been the Nebraska Soybean Board Weekly Market Roundup being brought to you by Nebraska Soybean Farmers and their checkoff right here on the Rural Radio Network.